but I will hold my breath. I will not fear the war. I will not fear the storm. My help is on the way. My help is on the Uh, Psalm 119, verse 1 says, Joyful are people of integrity who follow the instructions of the Lord. Joyful are those who obey His laws and search for Him with all their hearts. They do not compromise with evil, and they walk only in His paths. You have charged us to keep your commandments carefully. 
Oh, that my actions would consistently reflect your decrees. So we're going to spend um, a little bit of time praying together. Um, we know that God's word, by reading God's word, is how we get to know him. We know that in God's word, the Holy Spirit renews our minds and transforms our lives. We also know that um, reading God's word isn't always something that comes easy or something that comes natural. And so today we're going to spend some time praying for, for three things. And so if, if you would like to pray by yourself, don't want anyone praying with you, you can go ahead and just bow your head and no one should bother you. But if you want to pray with other people, then you can look to your right, look to your left and just see if there's anyone there who wants to pray for you. But the three things we're going to pray for today, that we would hear from God's word, that we would respond to God's word, and that we would have a hunger for God's word, both individually and as a church. So we'll spend some time praying for these things.
to a time of offering now and this is not a ending to worship it's a continuation I'm going to just pray over each heart each household represented in this body Lord that we would have clarity of mind clarity of vision for what you're doing in our lives the things you want us to accomplish the challenges you want us to stand up and tackle and Lord you would fill us with joy and generosity and love for those around us in Jesus name Welcome to High on Christian Church. My name is Brian. I'm one of the pastors here, and it is time to start signing up for Kids Camp, one of the most exciting weeks of the year. So at the end of the service, there will be a chance to sign up back there. Miss Sue will be telling you a little bit more about that. We want to welcome you for uh, coming here and worshiping with us today. I know some of you may have to take a boat to get here, but we appreciate you being here with us. So 
Um, on your chair or very near your chair, you'll find a Connect card, and that has a lot of the next steps that we offer listed. So if uh, you want to find out more about those steps, um, or even if you have a question about anything else, there's room on there for that. If you just want to get connected to somebody, if you just want to fill that out and go get a cup of coffee with Jason, he would love to get a cup of coffee with every one of you here at some point. So he enjoys doing that. Um, to, uh, also, uh, this coming Wednesday, the next two Wednesday nights, we're inviting everyone back here to have a time of prayer and worship together. Um, we know there are a lot of things we would like God to do in our lives, the lives of the church, and the life of this city. We know that he's doing a whole lot and working, and we just want to have him reveal what he's doing to us. And so the next two Wednesday nights, starting at 6.30, we're going to meet back here and we're going to pray together. So um, put that on your calendars. Uh, bring the kids with you. There won't be child care, but the kids can come and pray with us as well. So we're in the... Uh, the second week of a series we just started called A Picture's Worth. And so last week uh, we talked about how the Christian journey, the Christian life is like a runner and just asking the question, are we running the race that God set before us or are we compromised or are we settling for a different race? And today, uh, Mr. West, the bearded bald man, is going to become talking about the scriptures in uh, Timothy where it compares the Christian walk to being a soldier and looking at what that means. So before Wes gets up here, Miss Sue's going to come up and talk to us a little bit about that as well. So kids, when you hear that music, you can come on down. Stuff is going on always in May. I know everyone's schedule is so crazy full, especially if you have high school kids and tournaments and graduations and college kids. All that stuff happens in May and June. So I just want to say um, we are gearing up for kids camp. Love to see all of the fun. Such a testimony. I want to say I'm going to be talking about this every Sunday for a little bit. Um, we do have this um, baby um, bl blessing sign up sheet where we're just going to gather the babies and pray for their lives, thank the Lord for their presence here in this community, and it's a very special moment. Sign up so we know that um, you want to be a part. Also, um, Kids Camp has two important features. One is the adult community that gathers around this, and the second one is the servant leaders, which is the rising sixth graders through high school and beyond. I love them. I'll take them forever. But we can't do Kids Camp <laughs> without the high school kids, the fight club kids, because they are my safety net in the park. So I just want to keep saying, kids, thank you so much. I know it's not an easy three days, but I need you for those three days. And adults, um, actually, I think it's fairly, uh, your hour of work is really intense, but the rest of it's such fun fellowship. And I want to say this one thing about kids camp is this. I don't know how many seeds are planted on a kids camp adventure of three days. I really don't. We do have some of the children say yes occasionally. Um, but this one thing I do know, that when we lift up our banners in a public park in our city in the name of the living God, God does something we never may ever know. And I told my crew that's beginning to gather, I think this is the most powerful thing we do, is gather in the name of Jesus and declare him as truth. He is, and our culture needs to know it. So come join us in this declaration. Take days off work. Just come be a part. It's a beautiful community to be in, and we need you. The more, the stronger we are. Okay, that's it. Sign up is back there. And children, it's okay for you to start inviting your friends and signing them up too because parents are making summer camp plans. So you invite your friends. It's a really good thing. Okay. Um, I thought of this song. Do you guys know this song? I may never march in the infantry, ride in the cavalry, shoot the artillery. I may never fly o'er the enemy, but I'm in the Lord's army. Yes, sir. And um, I didn't think about that until just a minute ago. Um, when I was a kid growing up, we talked, there were songs about being a soldier in the kingdom of God, a soldier. Um, now listen, um, <clears throat> I never thought about having a soldier in my family, you know, one that really goes to war. 
I mean, such an interesting conversation. But I, I was very comfortable with you and I being soldiers in the kingdom of God. But um, we had a, a son, and his name is Matthew, and we have a picture of him. And um, <clears throat> this was um, the Friday or Saturday before um, he enlisted as a Marine. And um, we took family photos, and I just wanted to do all those things, because you know, when a man gives his life to something, you're not sure he's going to come home. And so um, I just wanted to do all the things, say all the words, say, say what you need to say. And if God brought him home, woo! <laughs> wow. But if you're going to lay down your life, then it's a possibility. So we got the picture, well, we got the pictures taken. Keep it up. Don't take them down. This is what we're doing right now. So this is um, us loving him and uh, standing beside him as he, he felt real compelled by God to go do this thing. And so the next time we see him, three months and some odd days later, he looked like this. I couldn't find him in the crowd. Um, <laughs> he didn't even want us to touch him because he had been yelled at for three months or so and no one had been kind and he wasn't ready yet for kindness. He was a trained Marine and very, very different from the young man that we had said bye to, goodbye to three months before. Um, he really did change. He had a real journey with weight, and, and that was his, he probably worked a year running up the mountain in our backyard because the recruiter said he had to learn X amount of weight before he could even sign up. And um, so he got near the goal, he signed up, and then lost another 20 pounds at boot camp. And uh, there's our Marine. Um, kiddos, look at me. We're not talking about changing like he did as a Marine. I want you to keep it up there. Don't take it down. Um, look at me. We don't look like soldiers who wear uniforms, do we? We don't. I want to read you this verse in um, Philippians. And it says this, and listen, above all, you must live as citizens of heaven, conducting yourself in a manner worthy of the good news of Christ, standing together with one spirit, one purpose, fighting together for faith, which is the good news. We fight together, and we're to have one voice and one spirit. I want to show you this next picture. Um, the men, these are all fresh recruits, and um, they walk the same, they look the same, their arms go the same, their heads are the same. I, you can't find your son in that picture. And I'm not sure he was my son in this moment. He was a Marine. And he had, look at me, there was a new commander in, in my son's life, and um, he had to listen to his commanding officer. And when they said, march, you march. And when you put down your back, when they said, do anything, you did it just like that. He was trained and he was obedient. And if you weren't obedient, you got in trouble and it cost you something. He learned. And that's what they look like at the end of training. They're one voice, one walk, one step. And, and in this building right here, we are all people most of us, and if not, you're watching today, who have one voice, one spirit. And we may not look like that on the outside, but look at me. We all look like that on the inside. One voice, one spirit. And the kingdom of God is an, is an army of soldiers. And who do, who's, who's the voice do we listen to? Jesus. Let's say it together. One, two, three. Jesus. Let's say it loud. One, two, three. Jesus, it's his voice we listen to. He is, we are in the Lord's army, and inside we should look like that, just the same. Today you have a cutting sheet, and it is armor. It talks about armor in the body, um, in the Bible. And you're just going to cut it, color it, and put it in. You could put this in your Bible and keep it as a reminder as I'm a soldier. And I've got one voice to listen to. And who's that voice? And he changes us all and makes us look the same. How about that? Let's go have busy hands and listening ears. I joined the Marines in 1990. 
and uh, newly graduated high school, um, 18 years old, <clears throat> just uh, got back with some friends um, on a beach trip. And then I get a phone call uh, asking if I wanted to leave for boot camp. They had an opening in 24 hours. And I said yes. Well, I joined uh, the Army National Guard uh, straight out of high school. I had to get my mom to sign the papers because I was 17 years old. She begrudgingly did that. Um, I actually remember going to the Olive Garden with my sister and my mom and then begging me to go to college, which I did begrudgingly. And I signed up, uh, I went to a military college in North Georgia, but they allowed you to serve in the National Guard at the same time. So I enlisted, went straight to basic training two days after I graduated high school. I ended up going uh, getting on that bus, going to um, what's, what sounds like a nice place, Paris Island, South Carolina. <laughs> getting there, I would probably say, <clears throat> um, was a huge culture shock for me. Um, these drill instructors that sound like, look like bulldogs, um, ordering and rushing and pushing, and um, you know, and they hand us an ink stick and a piece of paper and say, uh, uh, you, you got eight seconds to write a letter home uh, letting your family know that you made it here safely. And my letter said, please come get me. <laughs> and I, I'm not going to say that it was that tough because I'd always dreamed of being a soldier. Um, you know, the shaved head, the colorful language of the drill sergeants, all that kind of stuff. That didn't necessarily um, shock me or present a lot of challenges. What really killed me was when I'd wake up in the morning, we were in these open bays and you had bunks of everybody in your platoon next to you and you'd be having this great dream. And then all of a sudden, a trash can would come flying down the aisle, you know, the drill sergeant screaming and, and you wake up and it's like 4.45, 5 o'clock in the morning and you're getting ready to run out to do PT and you have that split second where you're coming from the dream to realizing, oh yeah, I'm in here with a bunch of shaved head guys we're all wearing the same thing. This is real, and this is just going to keep going on and on. So that was that was probably the most challenging thing coming from waking up. You know, hey, honey, it's time for school. To something very different. But you know, I think the transition from being a civilian, you know, to becoming a Marine um, was was very difficult. Uh, just you know, being a child, being a son, uh, being a football player, and all these things. Um, and, and feeling like your life had uh, some kind of order, even if it was um, uh, dysfunctional, um, that now it's, it's uh, organized dysfunctional chaos. And so it was a, it was a culture shock. Uh, probably the biggest challenge for me, and I know this is gonna sound redundant, but this is all sleep related. Um, the lack of sleep, the Army likes to do things at night, and I was in the Airborne Infantry, so we were always moving at night, we were always doing things. And of course, they're gonna make you do stuff during the day too, you know, clean weapons, uh, prepare, plan, all that kind of stuff. So you didn't get a lot of sleep when we were in training or out in the field. And uh, you're operating heavy machinery, jumping out of aircraft, carrying a machine gun around, and you've got like two hours of sleep. Um, so we would always try to find little times to take naps. So I remember one time I was, we were getting ready to jump into Fort Bragg we were flying from Georgia and I was in the aircraft and I was, you know, I had an 80 pound pack on my legs and I'm fast asleep. And the guy next to me, the jump master was starting to give commands that we need to get up and get ready and get ready to jump out of the aircraft. And he was just like punching me in the helmet as hard as he could to get me to wake up. And, you know, normal people at that point and me normally would have been terrified, but yeah, sleep was, Losing sleep was a really tough thing. I would say my hardest uh, point in boot camp was not being able to call home, um, the ho being homesick. Um, we, we were able to write letters, receive letters, um, but they would only pass out letters certain days of the week. Um, it was always something to look forward to, but post reading letters um, was, was hard. But there was a motivation to graduate and to becoming a United States Marine. And as boot camp went on, and I just kept pressing through, pushing on, um, and, and, during the, and during that race and that season, um, I wanted to wear those dress blues.
Since we're in a series, A Picture is Worth, I was trying to think of an image of a soldier, a picture to use. So I thought, wouldn't it be neat if I wore my old uniform? Well, apparently, someone has let themselves go. <laughs> that was 40 pounds and 14 years ago, so that, that did not work. What image comes to mind when you think of a soldier? What image comes to mind when you think of military service? I think most of us, when we think of military service, I know this is what comes to my mind or what came to my mind before I actually entered the Army, was an absolute transformation and dedication of an individual that's willing to perform a mission regardless of personal cost or loss. That's the image that would play in my mind. I, I have watched war movies and, you know, Saving Private Ryan and, uh, and, and stuff like that. So I had this image in my mind of someone who was willing and committed to absolute fidelity towards seeing the mission completed. That's why the picture of a soldier works so well. And it wasn't much different in Paul's day. You see, when Paul uses military metaphors, immediately his audience began drawing a picture in their mind of what a soldier looked like. Soldiers were a part of everyday life. That's why we see Paul using this language so often in his letters. Well, this morning, we're going to look at Paul's use of the picture of a soldier in 2 Timothy. It's important to understand a couple of things about this short letter, this epistle. You see, this epistle is basically, if you boil it all down uh, to, to just one statement, is about preserving and protecting the gospel and then taking that gospel to the world. But you see, 2 Timothy is kind of Paul's last will and testament to the church. This is the last letter he's going to write. He is basically writing this thing in the shadow of his own gallows, and he knows where he's heading. He knows that his death is soon to come, and he's concerned that he was going to be able to pass the baton of faith and leadership on to the next generation successfully. See, Paul is part of this first generation of Christians. Those that had, eyewitness, had been eyewitnesses to the resurrection, had been with Jesus on earth, had experienced his miracles, had been taught personally by Jesus, they find themselves coming to the end of their lives. The church is now 30 years old. Many are dying just due to natural causes. But many are finding themselves in a situation where they know they're going to have to give their life for their faith. And they don't want the chain to break with them. So Paul is writing to a young pastor in Ephesus, a young man by the name of Timothy. Now, Timothy is somewhat of, a, of an interesting individual when we study and we look at his life. He had went with Paul on a previous missionary journey. Paul decided to carry on somewhere else from Ephesus. And he left Timothy there to set the church in order. So that's where Timothy finds himself. He's the pastor of this church, and it's, uh, it's kind of an unlikely match because in this church we know there's false teaching going on. That's part of the reason Timothy was left there, was to deal with that. And um, we see a leader who is perhaps something less than what we would think of as a good leader in this situation. You see, Timothy physically was a weak man. We know he was sick very often. He had a lot of ailments, a lot of trouble. We know that he struggled greatly in his ability to be the leader that he needed to be in the situation in which he found himself. So Paul is writing. Apparently, he's gotten word that Timothy is struggling. He's writing this letter because he wants to ensure that he's transferring the baton successfully. There's some things that Timothy needs to get recalibrated in his mind and his heart if he is to carry the faith into the next generation. Don't necessarily think of Timothy and his weakness and leadership as a bad thing, though, because you see, it is in our weakness often that we see God gain the most glory. So Timothy is struggling. 
Paul wants to reinforce his faith, reinforce his mission. And so he writes this letter to him. And we read in 2 Timothy 1, beginning in verse 13, these words. He says, Hold on to the pattern of wholesome teaching you learned from me, a pattern shaped by the faith and love that you have in Christ Jesus, through the power of the Holy Spirit who lives within us. Carefully guard the precious truth that has been entrusted to you. As you know, everyone from the province of Asia has deserted me, even Phygelus and Homogenes. May the Lord show special kindness to Anisiphorus and all his family, because he often visited and encouraged me. He was never ashamed of me because I was in chains. When he came to Rome, he searched everywhere until he found me. May the Lord show him special kindness on the day of Christ's return. And you know very well how helpful he was in Ephesus. Before, before Paul begins to even address Timothy, he gives him examples of unfaithful men and one faithful one as an example. These are men that Timothy knew. He probably was aware of the situations that led to either their faithfulness or their unfaithfulness to the ministry. And Paul is pointing that out. And then he begins speaking directly to Timothy, beginning in chapter 2, where he says, Timothy, my dear son, be strong through the grace that God gives you in Christ Jesus. You have heard me teach things that have been confirmed by many reliable witnesses. Now teach these truths to other trustworthy people who will be able to pass them on to others. Endure suffering along with me as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. Soldiers don't get tied up in the affairs of civilian life. For then they cannot please the officer who enlisted them. And athletes cannot win the prize unless they follow the rules. And hardworking farmers should be the first to enjoy the fruit of their labor. Think about what I am saying. The Lord will help you understand all these things. And this verse 8, this is the foundation from which the previous verses rest. It says, always remember that Jesus Christ, a descendant of King David, was raised from the dead. This is the good news I preach. Paul uses the image of a soldier, of an athlete, and a farmer. And we're only going to look at the soldier this morning to reinforce Timothy's um, faith, his way of thinking. He needed, he needed some tools to carry out the mission he was given. And Paul is reminding him of those tools here. He is reminded of his transformation. He is reminded of his mission. He's reminded of the life expectations that he is going to face, and he's reminded of the focus. Now, let's not leave this in the first century because I think so often when we read Scripture, we tend to think of it as applying to someone else. That's not the case. You see, Scripture is, is relevant as much today as it was then. You see, Timothy found himself in a war, and it's a war not much different than what we find ourselves in today. You see, it is no exaggeration, it is no stretch to say that the walk of a Christ follower is very much a war. We see it in the way perhaps people react to us. We see it in perhaps other places where the cost is very real. But to be a soldier in this war, there is nothing but the front line. We have no luxury of a rear area. If you are following Christ, you are in a war, you are on the front line, and you're going to have to rely on the tools that God has given us if you're going to see the mission to its end, if you're going to see it completed. You see, Paul knows that Timothy must focus not on what looked like a dire situation around him. Rather, Timothy must focus on Christ and who he was in Christ. In verse 1, Paul begins discussing the transformation that has already taken place in Timothy's life. Anyone who has ever served will tell you one of the single most defining moments in their life is when they transitioned from a civilian to a soldier. And that happens in a Christ follower's life when we come to faith in Christ. And that is what 
Paul is reminding Timothy of. He's like, listen, the transformation has already taken place. See, this epistle begins by contrasting Timothy, a faithful servant of Christ, with the unfaithful servants of chapter 1. So we should ask ourselves the question, what is the difference? Why do some faithfully serve and others fall away and even do damage to the church? Why are some faithful and many prove themselves to be unfaithful? And the answer to that question is the transformation. The answer is the gospel. You see, those who are faithful have had their identities forever changed. I read a statistic last Sunday that said 48% of Americans are now classified as post-Christian, either in word or in deed. Post-Christian, not un-Christian. What that means is Post-Christian means they've had exposure to the gospel, they've had exposure to Christ, they have probably claimed it at some point in their life, yet they have rejected it and they have walked away. The difference between those that would be characterized as that and those who are truly Christ followers is a true transformation that has taken place. Paul mentions this transformation when he begins this, uh, this epistle. He says... In uh, chapter 1, verse 13, a small phrase that we see that's common in Paul's language and that we could quickly brush over if we're not paying attention. He says this, it's in Christ Jesus. The love that you have in Christ Jesus. This term, in Christ Jesus is speaking of an intimate union that is absolutely necessary, a union with Christ that is necessary if we are to remain faithful. It is a union that is so strong that when we stand in front of a holy God as sinners and he looks at us, he does not see the sin that has so marred our lives. Rather, for those of us who are in Christ, what he sees is the righteousness of Christ. That's what union with Christ really looks like. Now, he brings it home to Timothy here and begins to put it in, uh, into practical application. He says in verse 1, chapter 2, verse 1, Timothy, my dear son, be strong through the grace that God gives you in Christ Jesus. Be strong through the grace that God gives you in Christ Jesus. And we look at that and we think, really? Is that it? Like, he doesn't need to read how to win friends and influence people? Doesn't he need to read a leadership book? Is this really it? I mean, he needs to do something. Something's got to be fixed. If he's going to be strong, he's going to have to do X, Y, and Z. But Paul is pointing him to where the true transformation lies, and that is being strong, strong through the grace, the free unmerited favor of God that God gives us. But there is a real uh, misconception, I think, in the church today when we think about grace, because often... When we think about grace, we reduce it down to something that happened in the past. We think we come to faith by grace, and then it's kind of left up to us after that. That's an inaccurate picture of what grace actually looks like. Grace is not a one-time event. Grace is an ever-present, ever-flowing gift from God into the believer's life. It begins, yes, at salvation, but it is the only thing that will strengthen us and prepare us for the war ahead. And if we view it as a one-time event, the danger that we run into is trying to make it about ourselves and our own self-sufficiency. Yes, I needed, I needed grace to become saved. Now it's kind, of, it's kind of on me. And when we start thinking that way, we will inevitably turn our mission into nothing more than behavior modification. And if behavior modification is the weapon we use in our war, we find ourselves in a battle that we cannot and that we will not win. You see, when we replace grace with anything else, we're destined for failure. Perhaps Timothy was dealing with this now and was needing the encouragement to go back to this simple truth of resting in the strength that comes through the grace of God. That is the transformation that takes place between a civilian and a soldier. 
You see, to the civilian, you're a slave to the lie that you're self-sufficient, that you are enough, you're good enough. And while we are a slave to that, we are wholly and completely ineffective in the war uh, that is before us. It will never sustain us. It will only leave us wanting, and it will only leave us hungry for more. However, the transformation that takes place because of Christ transforms us from a slave to the lie of self-sufficiency to a soldier who is free to serve his commander and able to do so because of the strength that comes from him. A soldier is an interesting term as it's used in Scripture. In Greek, the term soldier can both be translated as soldier, a title, someone who's functioning as a soldier, or it can be translated as um, the act of being a soldier. And Paul now begins looking at the mission, what it looks like to actually be functioning as a soldier. You see, as a Christ follower, our faith is not inactive. It's an active faith. In the Great Commission, some of the last words that Jesus shares with his followers, he is explicit in his command to go. God is ascending God. God has a mission that he has set before us, and we are to be active in pursuing that mission. You see, to a soldier, the mission is the all-consuming focus of your life. You train for the mission, you prepare for the mission, you actually begin to look forward to the day that you get to put your training into practice. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, I remember 9-11, I was uh, driving to um, my company's headquarters and uh, heard on the radio about the first plane hitting. Um, get there, and I'm standing in my first sergeant's office, and we're watching on TV as the second plane hits. So we now know what's going to happen. Sure enough, by day's end, we were told, we don't know where you're going, but you need to be ready to go. Sure enough, we get the call. We're going. And uh, we're there at Fort Bragg, and the training has kicked up a notch. We're now preparing intensely uh, to be as prepared as possible when we actually get to where we're going. We don't know where we're going, but we find ourselves uh, crammed into the movie theater there on Fort Bragg. Uh, it's my unit, and then there's some elements from a, a special forces group that's with us. There's all this high-ranking brass coming in. We're getting briefings um, on the rank structure of Al-Qaeda. We're getting briefings on, on possible and potential whereabouts and all of this stuff. And we're like, we can't believe they're even telling us this stuff. We're being told things like 9-11 is your generation's Pearl Harbor, and you may well be heading into your generation's D-Day. So this anxiety is building, this excitement is building. Sure enough, we find ourselves on a plane where we know we're going. We're still not sure where we're going yet. We fly into an island in the Indian Ocean. We had to change planes because the plane we were on was much too large to land where we were going. We're there for 36 hours and we finally get the call. It's time to go. We go to the green ramp, which is where time just stops, apparently. It's basically a staging area where you prepare to get on the, on, the, uh, on the aircraft. And we're told there that where we are going, they will not fly an aircraft into during daylight hours. That's when it becomes real to us. So we're told to go to sleep because we're probably not going to get the opportunity to do so for another couple of days, which is a joke. So we sit there for hours. Finally, we board the plane. En route to our destination, Rumors start circulating in the plane that we're going to have to turn around and go back. Where we're heading is under attack, and they didn't want to land the plane there. Now, we never turned around. The assumption was that high-ranking uh, SF guy said, I'm going to be there tonight, and, uh, and they, uh, they gave him his wish. So we're coming in, and the plane's doing all the things it does when it's going into an area like that, and we're scared. All we have ever seen, all we have ever experienced is what we saw in training and what you see in movies like Saving Private Ryan. So the thoughts are going through our mind. What's going to happen when they drop the gate? Like, who's going to get shot? Well, we're going to experience indirect fire, direct fire. I mean, what, what's going to happen? All we knew is a contact guy was going to meet our plane. 
he was going to hand the senior man a chem light, which is like what you give kids at Halloween. He used to put it in the back of his helmet, and we were all to go in a dead run after him. We're coming in, and the flight crew is visibly shaken. And you know what they say on an airplane, if the flight crew's nervous, you probably should be nervous too. I mean, these guys are visibly scared of what's coming. We finally touch down. They start throwing our junk out the back. They don't even fully stop the aircraft. We go running off, and there we go. You know what happened? Nothing. <laughs> we take off running. We find ourselves in a terminal. We're crowded in, breaking one of the basic rules of combat, and that is do not give your enemy a one-and-done scenario where they can lob one round in and take care of a lot of you. And nothing happens, a mind-numbing nothingness. We're in what's called um, strict noise and light discipline. That means you can't talk, you can't make noise, you can't shine a light, you can't do any of that thing, but we just sit there. That was it. And that describes a good deal of the rest of my three years uh, in the Army. Sure, there were times of intense anxiety and, uh, and, and action, but most of the time, it was boring, mundane, just day in, day out, the same thing. However, the whole time, we were on mission. We were doing exactly what we were sent there to do. I think this is important because it's, if you talk to anyone who's ever served, that is such a common story. And I think it's very common to the Christ follower as well. Paul gives Timothy the mission in verse 2, he says, You have heard me teach things that have been confirmed by many reliable witnesses. Now teach these truths to other trustworthy people who will be able to pass them on to others. That's our mission. We are to teach others to teach others who teach others the gospel. That's it. It really is that simple. We try to make it grand. Where a soldier uh, perhaps is wrong in his thinking that, that his experience at war is going to look like a war movie, the same is true of a Christ follower who has all these grand plans of a dynamic gospel ministry and is going to do all of these things. But see, that is not the weapon of our war. We are so quick to try to turn things into something much larger than they really are when the command, the mission, is simply to teach the gospel to others who will teach the gospel to others who will teach the gospel. It may sound simple, but that is where the battles fought and that is how the war is won. We are doing a great disservice to ourselves when we pump ourselves up thinking it's going to be much bigger, much grander than what it probably will be. If you talk to the average seminary or Bible college student, if they're honest, most of them will tell you that they think they're probably going to be the next Billy Graham, or they're going to be the next big-name author, or they're going to be a megachurch pastor or something like that, when the reality is the vast majority of them will spend their lives serving in churches that will have less than a hundred people in average Sunday attention. What's it doing to our minds when we're expecting one thing? The reality is another, is we tend to think that when it doesn't look the way we think it is that we're somehow being unfaithful, when the reality is it's there that we really are being faithful. But let's not think that because the first two steps seem simple enough, the gospel, we, the grace of God, which has nothing to do with me. It's God's unmerited favor to me. The mission, which is simply to teach others who will teach others who will teach others. And we think it's simple, but we forget that it's still a war. And we have to have an accurate picture of the danger that lies ahead. And Paul addresses this as he's telling Timothy what his life is is going to look like and what he should expect. In verse 3 he says, Endure suffering 
along with me as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. We had a saying in the army, and I'm not going to repeat it, but basically it was embrace the misery, embrace the suffering. We would brag about who had it worse, who got there first, who did this, who, and it all centered around who had suffered most because whoever suffered most had the bragging rights. You see, a soldier expects suffering. Warfare, no one ever goes into thinking it's going to be easy. There is going to be things that are expected, suffering that is expected, and things that you've never even considered, like sand fleas that are terrible, horrible little creatures uh, that will make your life miserable. But if you were to transfer or translate th verse 3, literally, it would read, Take your part in suffering along with me. It's not an if, it's an expectation of when and something that we are told to expect to happen. And Paul knows this better than most and what it looks like to endure this suffering. This is not someone ignorantly telling someone else what to experience who's not experienced it himself. Listen to Paul's story in 2 Corinthians 11. He says, I have worked harder, been put in prison more often, been whipped times without number, and faced death again and again. Five different times the Jewish leaders gave 39 lashes. Three times I was beaten with rods, once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked, once I spent a whole night and a day adrift at sea. I have traveled on many long journeys. I have faced danger from rivers and from robbers. I have faced danger from my own people, the Jews, as well as from the Gentiles. I have faced danger in the cities, in the deserts, and on the seas. And I have faced danger from men who claim to be believers but are not. I have worked hard and long, enduring many sleepless nights. I have been hungry and thirsty and often gone without food. I have shivered in the cold without enough clothing to keep me warm. Then, besides all this, I have the daily burden of my concern for all the churches. Our mission as Christ followers, to teach the gospel to those who will teach the gospel and so on, requires a fidelity despite hardship. You see, we, we have a dangerous thought in our culture that Jesus, and I think it's because we don't experience suffering as much as some others, that Jesus is a nice little addition to our lives. He's something less than the all-consuming commander that must be the central focus of our lives. He's seen as something less than that that we can lean on, gain strength through His grace in the hardship. And when we see Jesus as nothing more than a cosmic band-aid, we can expect to become quickly become casualties of war because we will not be equipped to deal with the hardship that is coming. You see, to a Christ follower, like a soldier, oftentimes you do not have the broad picture in mind or the ability to view the whole picture. You only see your one tiny, seemingly insignificant, terrible spot that you're in. And all you have to hold on to is the reality of a sovereign God whose hand has not been taken from the situation, whose hand has not been taken from this world and the events that you're facing, but is still in control and has promised a final victory. See, to a soldier, much time is spent thinking about home. It's in our language, especially during training and deployments. It's 365 and a wake up, 364 and a wake up, every day and a wake up, you're counting down. Because you're looking to the right, to the privilege of going home. That the current hardships will end and one day you will get to go home. And for the Christ follower, it is this focus on the eternal reward that's waiting for us that should motivate us while we're living the life here today. Paul now brings this home by reminding Timothy of where his focus should be. He says in verse 4, Soldiers don't get tied up in the affairs of civilian life, for then they cannot please the officer who enlisted them. If we think of Jesus 
as being completely personal. He's kind of this part of my life. He's not the whole thing. We've got our mind on civilian affairs. Now understand, civilian affairs is nothing really bad. It's just the trivial things of life that Paul is telling Timothy to not focus on. Rather, he's telling him to focus on Christ. You see, there, there is no part-time soldier in this war. It's all full-time, and we must be focused not on the civilian affairs of life, but on our commander so that we may please him. Jesus addresses this in Luke 9. Um, he talks about kind of the double-minded person trying to follow him. He says to one guy, follow me. And the guy says, well, first let me go bury my father. The dude's dad wasn't even dead. What he's saying is let me hold out for my inheritance. Another guy says, well, let me first go home and say goodbye to my family. And Jesus remarks, he who's put his hand to the plow and turned back is unfit for service in the kingdom. We must remain focused on our commander. We must remain focused on Christ. We had a saying in the army, stay alert, stay alive. If you become complacent, you die. It's the same thing here. Like Timothy, if we fall into the temptation of starting to look at the dire situation around us, we lose focus. And when we lose focus, it's there that we will begin to fail in our mission. So Paul has summed, has summed this all up. A soldier is one who has been transformed. He is on mission. He is enduring the life that the mission almost always brings, and he's focused. Now, Paul ends this section in a way that's very common to him. You see, Paul can't wait when he's using metaphors of a soldier, an athlete, or a farmer, or whatever, to say, okay, the Christian life, it looks like this, and it looks like this, and it looks like this, but do you want to see the final example, the real example? The real example is found in Christ. Every illustration, every metaphor is used to build a more complete picture, and then he gives the real picture, that of Jesus Christ, at the end. Remember at the beginning I said verse 8 is what kind of holds the whole thing up? Verse 8, he says, always remember that Jesus Christ, a descendant of King David, was raised from the dead. This is the good news I preach. And the band can come on up. He points to Jesus because with Jesus, it's something real. It's not an abstract picture. It is our true example of what it means to walk with Christ. We see the example is Christ himself. Because you see, in Jesus, we have our transformation. In Jesus... We have our mission and the ability to perform it until it's completed. In Jesus, we can endure the life the mission often brings. It is in Jesus that we have our focus and our strength. And it is in Jesus that we find a commander worthy of worship and a high priest who is not ignorant of our sufferings but has endured far more than we ourselves will ever endure. So this morning as we go into a time of communion, let's reflect on what Jesus' life looked like. Let's reflect on the hardships that he endured, the mission that he endured so that we could be reconciled to God. Let's look at Isaiah 53 in closing. It says, He was oppressed and treated harshly, yet he never said a word. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep is silent before the shearers, he did not open his mouth. Unjustly condemned, he was led away. No one cared that he died without descendants, that his life was cut short in midstream. But he was struck down for the rebellion of my people. He had done no wrong and had never deceived anyone. But he was buried like a criminal. He was put in a rich man's grave. But it was the Lord's good plan to crush him and cause him grief. Yet, when his life is made an offering from sin, for sin, he will have many descendants. 
He will enjoy a long life, and the Lord's good plan will prosper in his hands. When he sees all that is accomplished by his anguish, he will be satisfied. And because of his experience, my righteous servant will make it possible for many to be counted righteous, for he will bear all their sins. I will give him the honors of a victorious soldier because he exposed himself to death. He was counted among the rebels. He bore the sins of many and interceded for rebels. So this morning, if you're here and you're a Christ follower, we invite you to remember with us the sacrifice that was paid by Christ. There will be couples around the room uh, holding a cup of juice, which represents the blood that was shed, that was sacrificed so that we could be reconciled to a holy God. And they're holding a plate of crackers, which represents the body that was broken. Take it, dip it in the juice, and consume it as we remember the transformation that was brought about by Christ and what he did on the cross.
Jesus, you're the King upon the throne. Thank you for the way you always love me. And now I get to love you in return. Now I get to love you. have a seat. 
endure suffering along with me as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. Soldiers don't get tied up in the affairs of civilian life, for they cannot please the officer who enlisted them. I just want to say thanks to Wes for the words this morning for opening up God's word. Um, soldiers, they don't endure comfort. They endure suffering. Are you tied up in the affairs of civilian life? Have you even been enlisted? Consider your enlistedness. Consider your sentness this morning. Soldiers are sent, and enlistment begins with belief. There's a reason why soldiers are stripped of civilian comforts in training. It was very obvious with Jeff and Grady's stories. It's so that they could please the officer who enlisted them. Consider how comfortable you are this morning. Comfort, I'm convinced, comfort, comfort is the primary distraction of the enemy. Comfort will dis distract us on our mission. Are you comfortable this morning? Is it easy? If so, consider your enlistedness. So, as we leave this morning, a um, couple things I want to remind you of. Tonight is a launch Sunday night. That means our Flintstones uh, kids and our Fight Club student ministry will be meeting for the final time this year. Forge will also be meeting. So if you're part of that, come tonight at 5 o'clock. And lastly, lastly, we want to feed you this afternoon. We are going through our final fundraiser for our Fight Club student summer camp. Uh, yes, exactly. So we're going to feed you should you want to be fed. And I can tell you that you will not endure much suffering in being fed this afternoon. We're going to have some chili in the back. If you'd wait around after we're done, we're going to uh, roll out some tables. If you would consider a $5 donation per bowl of chili, you won't get that anywhere else in Asheville this afternoon. $5 for a bowl of chili, and we'd love to feed you. Um, we need to raise a few more bucks to get our, our students to camp and would love you to join us. They'll, we'll have, if you don't like meat chili, if you're like a veggie chili, we'll have that too. Um, we might even have gluten-free. I don't know. I, I'm just going to say that we want to take care of all dietary restrictions. Please, please get some chili. So thank you all very much. Lord, thank you for your word. Um, thank you for, for how you have given us such a picture of what it means to serve you to be enlisted, to be sent, to believe. God, thank you that you have not called us on a mission of comfort. Yet you have promised suffering. Help us endure. Be our strength in what you require. In Jesus' name, amen.